probing. <laughs> All right, I'd like to call to order the Barstow Independent Board of Education's regular board meeting. Um, since we're all standing, let us say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is the minutes from the regular board meeting, November 20th, 2018. After everyone's review, does, do I have a motion for approval of the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any further comments or discussion? All those in favor of the approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting, state aye. aye. All those opposed, motion carried. Next item is the confirmation approval of the claims. <coughs> so in reviewing the claims for December ending, the total is $519,592.06. Of that amount, Fund 1 totals $324,722.87. That's about $22,000 more than we paid last year. There's a few reasons uh, for that difference. The first, you probably noticed again, we have fifth third payments, and that's for the new uh, credit card processing system that we have in place here. Um, so those payments you're seeing on your uh, claims report. For Fund 1, that totals about $102,000. Overall, for all funds, um, that's a little over $148,000. That's offset by a Kimi payment. Um, that is for our workers' comp. Um, and so last year, we paid about $26,000 more. We had a reduction this year in our um, insurance, our liabilities that's due. And then also offsetting that is <clears throat> a first insurance payment for about $55,000 and again that's uh, a reduction I'm sorry not reductions timing of payment for our property and general liability insurance we've had it a different period this time last year so if you all have any questions about your claims I'd be happy to answer that two points one um, uh, on item uh, page 32 of the Venus the Rick House was that a, uh, a catered event it was so our um, schools have different holiday parties for staff. Uh, it's not school funds that are generated. So what happens is if they have building rentals, um, things like that, um, staff contributions. This was for the high school specifically. Um, they had their party at the Rick House this year. Okay. And secondly, Madam Chairman, I will be abstaining from the vote on the financials due to conflict. Do I have a motion for confirmation and approval of the claims? So moved. Second. <coughs> Second. Second. Any other firm, further comments or discussion? All those in favor of confirmation and approval of the claims, state aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carried. Next <coughs> item is the financial work report. So before you today, you have the financial reports for November 2018 ending. Uh, the first item is going to be your treasurer's report and you see there's a verified cash balance of seven million two hundred fifty two thousand three hundred ninety eight dollars and eighty one cents beneath that you see the different funds that that's distributed through you see there's a large amount there in uh, fund one if you recall in february we'll make that payment or not payment but transfer for the property tax the nickels that will transfer to debt service that will pay um, our payments for our bonds that are outstanding. You see also Fund 400 has a large overture, so that'll cover that and the remaining payments that are due. And then also behind that, you have your balance sheets as well as your monthly financial report. This is a slow time as ever that it is in school finance, so I don't have much to report to you today. Um, but I wanted to give you a tax update so through last Friday, we've collected 88% of real and uh, tangible property tax that were issued. That's the same amount 
as uh, was collected at this time last year, so we're pretty much on track. So we've actually collected $7.5 million of the $804 million that was issued. The balance is approximately $750,000, the majority of which will be collected before January 2nd, which is when the uh, penalty period will begin. And then also, um, even though it seems really far away, this is the time of year that we begin to develop next year's budget. Uh, there was a, there's a requirement for the board to review the draft budget by January 31st of each year. Dr. Clark and I have had several discussions over the last month, and then we'll also continue to develop the uh, budget over the next several weeks, and you'll receive that draft budget at the January regular board meeting. This information is always very primitive due to many unknowns, uh, such as enrollment, next year's needs, um, current year ending balance. So broad projections are going to be used at this point in the budget cycle. But then as we go through spring and get closer to the tentative budget that's due in May, we'll get closer um, towards the working budget. Those estimations will firm up for September. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, you're very welcome. <coughs> Next item is our <coughs> superintendent's report. Um, I'll have a, a couple of things to share with the board today, um, and I, uh, so guests, you guys be patient for just a moment. You'll get to hear the first part first. Um, as you all remember, uh, this is the third uh, regular meeting in a row where I have shared a different standard uh, under the superintendent's standards, and standard three is what I'd like to uh, describe for you and give you some, some um evidence of today. So standard three is cultural leadership. <coughs> um, to provide a summary of that, uh, superintendents understand and act on the important role a system's culture has in the exemplary performance of all schools. They understand the people in the district and community, how, how they come to their current state and how to connect with their traditions in order to move, move them forward to support the district's efforts to achieve individual and collective goals. While supporting and valuing the history, traditions, and norms of the district and community, a superintendent must be able to reculture the district if needed, to align goals with the district's goals for improving student and adult learning, and to infuse the work of adults and students with passion, meaning, and purpose. I thought it would be very appropriate, uh, and I guess my first comment on that description is, Bardstown City Schools is a very special place. Um, this is a place that not only I admire and love being a part of, but I think that the vast majority, if not all, of those involved in this district would say the exact same thing. Um, my responsibility is not to reculture uh, a place like Barstown City Schools, it's to make sure that we stay focused on those things that make us special. So there's been a number of things that I've done uh, in my first few months as superintendent to support a strong culture and have a, just a, about a minute and a half video that kind of gives you a glimpse of the different things that we've done.
So <clears throat> that's just a very small sampling of, of things that, uh, you know, we've been, we've been very purposeful about and celebrating and, and there's many, many more that probably could be added to that, uh, that short, quick video. Um, but, but our culture here is very strong, uh, very blessed to be in a, a place like our Sun City School. So um, I guess now what I'll do is I will shift and uh, share other things that are very special about this district. <clears throat> And that is that we have very dedicated staff that have uh, achieved great things. So what I'd like to do uh, is if I could invite Ms. Danielle Hill and Mr. Walt Eveland, and then also Ms. Felicia Rudolph, just to step forward. Um, and I wanna share that um, Ms. Hill and uh, Mr. Eveland both have achieved national board certification uh, which, if I'm not mistaken, makes 11 nationally board certified teachers in our district. Um, and then Ms. Felicia Rudolph is a real, real important reason why we're having such success because this is a very rigorous process. Um, and they, they maybe could talk just for a moment about their experience preparing and, and working through this. But Ms. Rudolph has mentored at least half, if not more than half, of our teachers that have achieved national board certification so before you guys share anything uh, i want to congratulate you um, for this awesome accomplishment so mr Evelyn, you the process for you uh was i know <coughs> we work in the same school so i know you worked very hard you saw the whole thing uh, so it's four years long um uh for me um uh miss rudolph i talked to her right when I started because she was actually teaching my youngest daughter at the time and she agreed to uh, start reading my papers um, I'm not a gifted writer I'm, I would say I'm a gifted teacher working with kids I'm I think but I don't write very well and she read everything I wrote and wrote and wrote <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for years um, and years, and years, and years. <laughs> uh, but um, in the end of it, uh, one of the things that was difficult is we didn't know what it, the process was looking like because they were rolling out the process as we were doing it. Every year they'd say, oh, here's the new thing, or here's the new thing, or here's the new thing. Um, my certificate is early adolescent social studies, so 11 through 15 social studies. Um, there are 77 of us in the state with that certificate. Um, I couldn't find any within about 45 minutes of Bardstown that have that certificate, um, which made it difficult for Ms. Rudolph because this is not her area. But she was dedicated, and one of the reasons she was dedicated is I had her son <laughs> while <laughs> she was reading. <laughs> we just swapped. She helps me when I help Elliot. I don't think I've said that. <laughs> I know my process was um, it started at a point where we didn't have mentors they didn't um, give us mentors when we first started and then along the process Felicia jumped on board and said okay and there were six of us going through the process at the primary school at the same time um, when we got scores last year I was two tenths of a point away from passing and I thought okay what am I gonna do am I gonna throw in the towel or am I gonna keep you know trucking on this journey and um, I kept going and so when I got scores this year I was nine points above what the score you know was needed um, so this journey it's been um, stressful at times it's been moments where the kids are playing in the backyard and I was sitting in front of the computer working um, I can't thank my principals and Felicia and my husband enough um, and the support that I had from the other five that were going through it to say hey keep going you know it's worth it in the end um, I feel that earning the National Board Certification was a better route than just earning my rank one in a certificate that I wasn't going to use because I love what I do in the classroom and I feel that National Board has prepared me to dig deeper as a teacher and really look into what we're doing instead of just <coughs> doing it. You know, there's a process of why we do what we do every day and National Board really helped to dig in and do that. So. When I certified 10 years ago, there was nobody in the district that was certified. And so I had to go to Lawrenceburg for my mentor. And she was kind of like Walt and I, the opposite end of the spectrum. <laughs> she was um, 
high school English certified. So she had absolutely no idea what to do with me and preschoolers. Mm -hmm. But she could give me advice on my writing and whatever I was, what I was hitting on. So I was, I knew that with Walt I could easily help him because I saw that she could help me. She gave me that guidance. Um, with the, the primary school is really fun because they're all my certificate. Mm -hmm. And so it was fun watching where my kids are going and how the teaching is still the same principles, but how you can teach differently and what more you can do with older kids. Mm -hmm. it's really, it was really interesting to watch that. Um, the process for me really changed who I was as a teacher. So I was really excited to be able to have more people join me in the district and go through the process and change how they thought and become better teachers. I think our kids deserve it and it makes us um, better as a whole to have people that are really examining their teaching and what they're doing and why they're doing it. Yeah. Thank you guys. You'll join me in uh, congratulating you. Great accomplishment. Thank you very much. Felicia, what grades do you teach? I'm preschool. Preschool. Mm -hmm. um, I, right now I'm doing special ed at the preschool. I was three year old for the preschool. How many more in the pipeline do we have that are uh, trying to be certified as well? Yeah. Four, four at the primary that are um, interested and three yeah. that we know are going to start the process <coughs> in January. We don't have anybody, Miss Amy Adams is the only person other than me in the district who certified above primary school and to my knowledge we don't have anyone else in the pipeline mm. um, above that. I think Amy is coming up for recertification soon. I think she was two years behind me. And then Angel Philiatry. And I don't think she's going to be certified. She's, she's yeah, she doesn't have enough. <laughs> so once you're yet. certified, you have to continue. Yes, continue I just certified this year, so yeah. I'm good for another 10 years. Oh. And ours is five years. They changed, we were that new That's rollout, so ours is every five years we will have to recertify. After my That's 10 years, then I have to do five. Yeah, well, congratulations, wow. good work. Yeah, I have a curly headed girl, <laughs> granddaughter in the preschool. So <laughs> keep an eye on it. Reese Roby. Oh, okay. Yes, she's adorable. I help her off the bus every day. <laughs> <laughs> that concludes the superintendent's report. All right. Sure you don't want to sing mm -hmm. Christmas Carol? <laughs> <laughs> it would just be me. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> um, all right. Um, do I have any um, visitors to recognize at this time? If not, we'll move right on to our next. Um, item which is the focus of delivery targets for the Barksdale Elementary School. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Courtney is going to share his ideas with us. <clears throat> All right, so um, just to kind of piggyback on Dr. Clark, like with his cultural focus uh, being the new superintendent, uh, by the way, if you don't know, I'm Brian Courtney, so I'm the new principal at the elementary school coming from outside of the district um, by the way of Jefferson County uh, spent two years there as administrator I was in bullet for nine years my first nine years and then I spent one year uh, in Nelson County as a assistant principal at the high school so um, coming in like I said as a as a first year principal um, so my like him my focus one of my focuses is, is to focus on culture because um, the staff doesn't know me you know so you have to build that trust and relationship um, with your staff members and your students and your stakeholders like your parents uh, before you can move forward because my number one fundamental role is to drive student achievement that's my role as a principal um, so the next slide. <clears throat> so my two things that I'm going to talk about today is like like I said instructional and then the cultural so the mission um, hasn't changed at the elementary school. So through cooperative efforts of students, parents, staff, is to educate every child while nurturing the talents and abilities of each student in a positive environment. So the vision is the same as the district vision. And then, so we kind of pulled a motto out of the mission, um, you know, with kind of staff input. So we have shirts as staff members, and we start the year with growing every student every day, live purple and gold. So that's our motto at the elementary school. So we try to tie, regardless whether it be instructional or cultural, we try to tie everything back to that motto, which, like I said, growing every student every day is not just focused.
folks that aren't academics. It's also folks that are coping skills, social skills, um, just giving them what they need, whether it be, you know, clothing or, you know, just a hug. You know, but focusing, like I said, growing those students, trying to help them be better future selves is what, is what our goal is. So coming in, um, and it's my staff, so I'm kind of presenting this to you all as well. Like my core beliefs um, as a principal coming in, so culture before everything else, which is the brand. Um, you see now businesses, but now schools have to brand themselves because you have choice. You, you know, school choice is an option. So you have to brand your school. So, you know, coming as a new principal, like I said, I want to build a place where people want to work, where they want to attend, send their, their kids to school by being honest, transparent, communicating with everyone, um, and not spending time on the distractions, like, you know, whether it be with the educators, what's going on with the pension, or just things at home, like we can't focus on those things because those things are distractions. We can only focus on what's going on in our building at that current time. So number two is support, retain, recruit good teachers and get out of their way. Um, let them take risks. It's okay to fail. Um, you learn from failure. So that, that's one of my big things. So if you have a staff, you know, that, and you create the environment that they're uptight and they're scared to make a mistake, then you don't, you don't create the best possible goals that you can create um, for, like I said, your staff members and your students. Um, now we are lucky and kind of coming in learning, we're lucky at Bardstown to, you know, this is a place where people want to work. Um, you know, so like when we have an opening at the elementary school, you know, I wasn't used to that, 30, 35 people applying for the job, whereas coming from Jefferson County, you're lucky to get one good applicant. So people want to work here, so we want to retain those good people that want to work here. Um, three, focusing on test scores, and this is my belief, um, is a malpractice. So I think developing future lifelong learners is the goal. Um, with the accountability system, you know, always changing, you know, it's easy to get caught up in what's the test scores, what's the test scores, what's the test scores. Um, you know, that's a big part of it, but if you just focus and teach towards a test because you put so much pressure on your teachers, um, you're not developing those lifelong learners um, with students and your staff. <clears throat> Number four, celebrate students and show them their successes often. Um, and you'll see as I, as I go forward with my presentation, you'll see um, ways that we do that. And then every kid knows and needs to know why they matter and their future matters. Once again, it's, it's that caring about and growing every student. All right, so this is um, kind of my, my culture piece. Um, this is kind of something I hang my hat on, uh, but culture is like a fragile egg. Um, and if you drop an egg and it cracks, there's no fixing it. Um, so you, you basically a lot of times have to get a new one. Um, so a lot of times we focus on everything that goes on, whether it be site-based teaching strategies, um, Chromebooks, thinking strategies, audits that we have, um, college and career readiness, CSIPs. So we, we a lot of times get focused on all of these things and this we have to focus on culture before we can get there. So that's why I say by celebrating all our successes loudly and proudly by any means necessary every single day and every decision that we make, that's what influences a positive culture. So these are, these are just some new things that I kind of created whenever I came in. Um, so we have like a tiger ticket system and so teachers they are given two of these per week and they can give them out to any student that they see. And it's, you know, doing the right thing, um, regardless of what it may be. If it's holding the door for another student, then the teacher can just give a student a Tiger ticket. Um, and not only are they giving them a ticket, and it could also be a student maybe who's just struggling with work, um, doesn't have a strong work ethic, but then they, you know, one day they come in and they work real hard. Well, you want to reward them right there for that. So these are just some things. So they can accumulate their tickets or they can turn them into me. Um, a lot of it, the most popular one, I'll just tell you, is the three tickets, the free snack or drink. They're always bringing them. So they work hard to accumulate those three tickets. Now, once you accumulate one ticket, 
we basically cut their name off and then we have a drawing. So we have a third grade drawing, fourth grade drawing, and fifth grade drawing. So we do that. So we draw two names out every Friday. So we make it a big deal. And then if your name gets drawn out on Friday, then you have a variety of prizes that you can choose from, like paint a block, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, the week dress down pass is a huge one. But you can see all of these things don't, it's not monetary cost. Um, so it's just something that kids really like that some of them kind of chose. So that's why um, we have those options on there. So <clears throat> like I said, we make a big deal about the Tiger ticket drawings. So like on Fridays, like I get on, like it's like a starting lineup for basketball. Mm -hmm. So we play music and it's amazing how quiet the building is whenever I get on the announcements. And then when somebody's name is called out of the room, it just erupts. Like I can hear it from my office. I can hear the screaming coming out of the office and then here come the kids. So like I said, that's just part of working hard and then rewarding them for their, like I said, hard work. So it may not be a kid that's making all A's. It may be somebody that has C's and D's, but you know, is working hard, pushing hard, struggling, but they're still, you know, being caught doing the right thing. So and then, like I said, when it, whenever we do that, we post to social media, and I'll talk about that um, as we go forward. So kids also receive the t-shirts, which it's just a Tiger Ticket Winner t-shirt, as you can see. And it's something that we say on the announcements every day, uh, be kind, be productive, and be awesome. So they also get the shirts that says that on the back. Um, like I said, so we post to social media, and like I said, we celebrate student success at nausea because now communication is on the net and we use that social media via Facebook as a platform to tell our story about our students. So that's one of the options that they can have um, is to paint blocks and they won't go anywhere. So this is like a tiger ticket wall. Um, so like I said, these walls won't be painted over. So there's more and more kids that are starting to add to them. So these were our first two. And you can see that uh, this student right here, she's proud to be a BES. So I mean, that was what she painted. And so you, you see that a lot. Um, and like I said, we are trying to build those. Once a tiger, always a tiger. So, you know, starting at primary, through the elementary, middle and high. So like I said, that's a good, it's a good thing and they love it. Um, so the next thing, is celebrating staff members. Not only do we celebrate students, we celebrate staff members. So Miss Sanders, she's one of the board staff members now, but she was our first employee of the month. So the way we pick that is I send out a survey um, with nominations. And so the staff sends me nominations and then we just kind of sort through on who has the most and you know what effect they had that month on students or other staff members. So like I said, we post this also to social media. Uh, we give them a certificate. And then we have a plaque, as you can see, that's hanging up in the front office where everybody can see it. So then it just has their name on. And this with our staff is probably my, my most favorite thing, enjoyable thing to do like on Friday afternoons when I'm there at five or six o'clock. So throughout the week, we have um, staff shout outs. So I have a form that I send out to the staff members and they can send it back to me with staff shout outs. And basically they're just celebrating some another staff members, you know, just something that they've done for them during the day or something that, you know, they've done good during the week. Um, and this just builds morale within your building, within your staff. So like I said, this was in interviewing the staff members, this was a big thing that they, they liked and want to want to continue. But I have anywhere between 30 and 40 responses a week just on staff shout outs. So we're looking at doing some type of student shout out as well, but we just we haven't got there yet. So that's that's kind of one of the things that we're going forward that because staff shout outs is working so well. All right, so the instructional part, like I said, so that was kind of our things that we focus on culturally. And now let's get to the instructional focuses. So being, like I said, as a new principal, like I want to see, you know, how, how, how the teachers teach, if there's, 
you know, any areas as a whole, you know, that we struggle at or we have some weaknesses and what our strengths are as a staff. And that just helps, you know, develop professional development um, and training for those teachers as a whole. So we have instructional walkthroughs. And basically those walkthroughs are 10 to 15 minutes. So I have my own leadership team, which um, consists of myself, my assistant principal, and my counselor. So we do nine, three each. So we do nine walkthroughs. Like I said, we have 39 teachers. So we do nine walkthroughs per week. Um, and we have our admin meeting, leadership meetings on Monday mornings, every Monday morning. So we discuss our walkthroughs that, that we go in and that we, you know, that we're watching. Like I said, we have a focus and I'll show you the walkthroughs in a minute. Um, so we discuss those walkthroughs and just what we, what we saw, um, you know, the week before on that Monday. And then so we use that as coaching sessions with the teachers. Um, not necessarily I'm coming in and, oh, I caught you doing something. We are coaching them you know, to be better teachers or like I said, those areas. So two areas that we are focusing on based on those walkthroughs is questioning techniques that extend learning and promote higher level student thinking. Um, so not focusing so much on recall questions, but focusing more um, on that deeper level, that deeper, deeper learning um, questioning techniques. And then the other is formative assessments. So making sure that we are assessing every day at the end of at the end of each lesson okay what kids what kids are struggling so we know right then and there what kids are struggling with the lesson so we can try to intervene so <clears throat> the teachers were a little nervous at first but now that they see that all we're, we are coaching them and not evaluating them every time that we come in so they're a little more comfortable with it and now are seeking uh, input and advice on what to do and so my next, our next uh, instructional focus area is vertical alignment with the primary and middle schools. Um, so I, I had a conversation with Ms. Taylor, um, you know, about some of the areas that sixth graders may be struggling with uh, coming in to middle school. So that just kind of started that conversation with us. Um, so now we're going to have vertical alignment meetings where fifth and sixth grade math and ELA teachers will be meeting actually on January the 2nd, um, and the same thing with second and third grade. So basically those discussions will center around what knowledge and skills the students, what must they know and when they come in for that, that next grade level. And then my last thing is focus groups. So focus groups, so we, we kind of went through like our map data um, and teachers, you know, had to we have a great staff because there's several teachers that volunteer to work with these students, these focus group students on their planning, um, which they did not have to do that. So, you know, when we talk about great staffs, BES has a great one. And so basically what focus groups consist of are 20 students in each grade level, third, fourth, and fifth, so 60 total students um, that are just right there on the cusp of mastering those standards. They just need a little bit more support um, from a certified teacher and not a computer program and not an instructional assistant, but from a certified teacher that knows the content um, just to master, like I said, to master those standards and to get there. So that's the basis of our focus groups. And then those students, their data is monitored monthly with pre and post assessments. And as you can see, this is our, this is our walkthrough tool. Um, and like I said, we just go through and it's observed, not observed, and not applicable for the day or at the time period that we're in there. And then we just write notes and questions on the side. Um, and then like I said, we just have a five minute meeting with each one of those teachers to kind of reflect on the learning chart or the, like I said, the instructional walkthroughs on, on things that we saw or things that we needed to see. And like I said, right here is kind of, this is our, one of our areas of focus is just avoidance of recall question. Like I said, that's that deeper, deeper level, deeper learning questioning techniques that we're focusing on. So just in wrapping up, and like I said, the reason why we really use social media as our platform is because if we don't tell our story um, on the net and on the web and on social media, 
then someone's going to tell it for you. So, you know, we try to try to put it out there ourselves. So, you know, social media is an insanely powerful culture piece, um, and then we use it for commun communication second. And I haven't met a teacher, parent, or student yet that hasn't found positivity and interaction um, on social media or the communication wise. So like I said, in the age of school choice, we have to protect, protect our brand. And like I said, our brand is Barstown City Schools. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. I said it on the PLC meeting and uh, the teachers talked about having a list of best practices. Do you say, do you still have that, or is that? Have you heard? Have you seen them or heard of them? Best practices. For yeah, I mean, like yeah, so there's, yeah, and there's several books out there um, with you know those strategies, best practice strategies. Um, and when you talk to teachers, whether it be like I said, questioning, there's best practices, routines and procedures, there's best practices. So. Yes, that is something that we do talk about um, and discuss, and we actually, you know, based on literature and research, you know, we try to create our own list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good presentation. <coughs> Thank you. All right. Our next item is um, the school year 2018-2019 comprehensive district improvement. Back. Mr. Yeah, Beck. you didn't come forward, did you? No, no, no. <laughs> He's ready. I'm going to try to use this wireless mouse from here. Normally in our presentation, what we do is we give you the actual CDIP for your approval, mm -hmm. and then we have a separate sort of presentation that condenses it down to these are the facts and just the facts. Uh, we're going to go in a little bit different direction this year. I want to kind of show you the entire document, uh, but I'm just going to highlight the components that are different this year. So every year for our school improvement plan, we have to address these five components, proficiency, gap, graduation, growth, and transition readiness. So I'm gonna go through each of those right now. The first one is the proficiency growth. Now what you'll see here is we'll have a goal that'll take us all the way out to 2030. We have to tie these to our state strategies. We have to tie these to our state activities. And then here's our one year objective. This is what we wanna do this year. And then these are the activities that we're going to have this year. And then these are gonna be the measures of success. Now in our internal documents, we'll also have all of our progress monitoring where we'll be writing, this is great, we need to look at this, wow, that didn't work, we need to go backwards. But for your purposes, I think this is the one we really need to focus in on because these are the actual things. Tell me, what are you going to do? And so what those are right here, are these are some things that we're going to be working on this year. Some of these things are extenuations of things that we've begun last year, if not previously, uh, in one of these in particular, our focus groups is now five years old, and we're doing some refining with that. In uh, some cases, we're stepping back a little bit. Uh, so let me go ahead and start with our first one, which is common benchmarks assessments. What we're doing this year is at all grade levels, K through 12, we're taking a look at our common benchmark assessments. You might remember them uh, as unit tests that a teacher would give at the end of a teaching unit to see how well the students did. We have common assessments so that the end of that unit in first grade looks the same whether it's in your classroom, your classroom, or your classroom. And we currently have that in our district. What we're doing now is we're going through a process to refine those for rigor, meaning do they actually meet the level of the standard? Are they too easy? Are they too hard? And alignment, meaning here's what you assessed, but is that what the standard said we had to assess? So we're looking at those two things, rigor and alignment with that. And we'll be doing that comprehensively K to 12 this year. And we'll be looking at what changes we want to make for next year. The next one is our focus groups. Our focus groups will continually go through a revision process. Probably one of the two biggest revisions you'll notice this year is we've got specific special ed focus groups. That was something we did not have before. They were embedded into all the focus groups. We have pulled them out and made a specific special ed focus group. The other thing you'll notice is we've moved a lot of the data to reporting a lot sooner. Uh, we had done it just uh, each semester, then we had done it quarterly, and now we're doing it unit-wise. So we sped up the data process with that. With our special education, this is a new one to address our TSI designation. Um, we're looking at the special ed program top to bottom, front to back. We've had uh, CKE's consultant, Ramona Karsner, come in 
and have her give us her overview. She's already done visits at primary, elementary, middle, high, is that correct, Lance? Yes, Sorry, I put you on the spot, I'll keep going. Um, yes. I, and um, she's given us some feedback on different things such as how we do scheduling, uh, how we're doing co-teaching, and what our next steps could be for that. And uh, Lance has is, is, uh, organized uh, that entire section of that for the special ed review. Then the next thing is our PLCs. Again, this is a continuation of one we've been working on for several years and refining it. Some of the things you'll notice different this year in our PLCs is we have an admin PLC where we have admin PLCs such as uh, Mr. Courtney with his admin staff and Ms. Spaulding meeting every Monday to have a tighter continuity between what's going on with the schools and what we know about here at the district level too. And then lastly is student advocacy. We're in the second year of developing that and uh, each of the schools is developing their own brand of student advocacy such as at the high school which is one of the more successful ones. They've developed the ACES program. Uh, you, you might know that as the program that most recently had the Career Exploration Day, uh, December 5th, I believe it was. And uh, so ACES addresses academics, community, economics, and uh, social emotional. And it's something that they do once a week for the students to advocate for each of the students to meet their needs. And again, this ties into what Mr. Courtney was talking about, meeting needs beyond just academic. What are their social and emotional needs too? So these are all of our current activities that we are going to use to address our proficiency goal. Now again, I told you there were five goals that we had to meet. A lot of these activities will overlap, so I won't go over all of the ones that overlap. So for our gap goals, we have the same activities because those address proficiency and gap also. When we get to graduation, we have some similar activities that we had previously, but we also have two different new ones that specifically hit just graduation. Uh, the first one is credit recovery. Uh, we've had some changeover with staff and the program that they're using, Play-Doh for credit recovery, and we noticed that we, we weren't achieving the credit recovery as fast as we usually do. We do a very good job of tracking that. So we immediately jumped into action and we got Play-Doh to come in and retrain the staff top down and uh, so we've set up some new goals for that and we're getting back on track with our students uh, doing credit recovery we found some holes that existed so we were very excited about Plato coming in the other one is our new district truancy officer uh, you know him as a former mayor mr. Bill Shackles and some of the amazing things he's doing with community outreach and uh, reaching out to the students and building those social contracts so that we can increase our attendance rate, which is very good, by the way, too. It's about at 96%, uh, but another barrier to graduation. Then we get to growth. Uh, the activities will be the same as gap and proficiency. And then lastly is transition readiness. Again, those activities will be the same as gap and proficiency also, but one that speaks specifically to transition readiness is our work that we're doing with the new skills for youth grant you may remember that presentation several months back that we were going to participate that with uh, nelson county larue washington county and marion uh, we have now gone through almost a half a year cycle with that and it looks like we're going to have four areas of increased pathways that will help our transition readiness for our students and those four areas are the addition of a teaching and learning pathway which that will actually occur in our high school uh, it will be housed at uh, Barstown City Schools High School. Uh, the other three will be nursing pathway at the ATC. They're going to increase that nursing pathway, hopefully leading to an LPN. Uh, the third, second one is the welding pathway. They're going to increase the welding pathway and add new pathways there also at the ATC. And the last one is the engineering pathway. They want to expand that uh, and even add a, a new teacher, which will allow us new pathway options for our students. So we're going to have four new pathway options for our students next year, and at least three of those pathways will have dual credit opportunities too. So that'll add even more to our catalog of dual credit, career readiness, certification, and uh, AP course offerings, which we have a very extensive catalog. And I believe that is the last one. So in a nutshell, this is our entire CDIP for the year. You can see some things that are a continuation from previous years. Some things are brand new for this year. It just depends. One of the great things about where we are as a district when we have to develop our certified uh, classified uh, plan 
is that we don't have to make a lot of overall changes. We need to continue on with some of the things that have been very effective. Our academics are in a very good position for us, so we do a lot of refining and tweaking. We've had to do a, sometimes a back step, as you always will, when you know, you're a district of innovation. We're, we're gonna make mistakes. But overall, we're very pleased with where we are, and that's why you'll see a lot of uh, repetition within our certified uh, improvement plan. Any questions? I saw uh, Superintendent Clark, I think, on my good Facebook getting stuck at the. Yes. Did he? How'd that go? Uh, getting stuck. Yeah. Uh, oh yes. So you know, I'm a team player. So we have we have a have a student, a bar sound student, that's taking some phlebotomy classes and she needed to practice. So I offered my arm <laughs> so that she could practice. Yeah. He was a right team player. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think the uh, recent headlines about KDE changing the uh, graduation requirements as far as, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about refining and tweaking. Is that, is that going to go beyond refining and tweaking when they implement yeah, these things? And that will definitely change some things for us. Uh, big picture first and foremost it will allow some flexibility in scheduling with us uh, for example the courses in math that they have to take or the courses in ELA that they have to take uh, some of them are less defined meaning you have to have uh, course one two but three and four are up to you so we'll now be able to use options such as medical math for the phlebotomy courses those can be used as part of the graduation requirements so it's going to allow us some flexibility and different options to get kids in the pathway that they, that they need. So it's really going to be a good thing, not just necessarily a burden. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> when you transition, that's going to be the difficult part because we have some that are still over the old one, but our incoming freshmen, it'll allow us transit. It'll allow us a lot of flexibility for them. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tim. And we uh, do need an approval for that. We do. So do I have a motion for approval of the school year 2018-2019 Comprehensive District so Improvement Plan? So okay. okay. All those in favor of the of approval of the school year 2018-2019 Comprehensive District Improvement Plan state aye. Uh, all those opposed? Motion carried. Next <coughs> item is the WHAS Crusade for Children Grant. <laughs> Good or I guess it is afternoon now. How are you? Afternoon. Glad to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm coming to you all to request the board's approval to apply for the 2019 um, WHS Crusade for Children grant. As you might recall, this is something I do every year around this time. Um, and this year, we're kind of continuing on our tradition of innovation, excellence, and mm -hmm. diversity in <coughs> exceptional child education. I think that's one thing we're very well known for in this in community. It's something that we've been able to really go out on a ledge with several of our projects because of uh, Crusade for Children funding. So I'm just going to go through with you guys what we're going to be asking for this year. And one thing that comes to my mind when we talk about this program in particular, and our kids here, or any child, is why fitting when you were born to stand out. Our, our parents are you know, very proud of the things we do, and they've kind of come to expect certain mm -hmm. things out of our district. So these funds have kind of helped us allow to continue either maintenance of those projects or addition of new projects. So the way I decide and kind of think about what might we need or what might we want as a school district is I really send out, I send out a survey to our special ed staff and I say, here are some of the things I'm considering. What do you all see as um, needs that could either enhance the services we're already doing or provide new experiences for kids? Some of our more recent projects that you might um, remember are the um, playground space, the new playground space at the elementary school that was funded from the Crusade grant, the indoor um, McDonald's play place. Mm -hmm. It's not really from McDonald's, but that's what it looks like. And, and the preschool. Mm -hmm. um, and then also our middle school snoozeland room. Well, what we're looking at this year is to add a snoozeland or sensory room at the preschool. The preschool is the only location in our district that doesn't have one. Um, we've identified a, a small area where this would fit and we're going to look at doing that since the preschool is the starting point for many of our most severe children with um, disabilities or most at need children with disabilities in the school district. The other thing we're looking at doing is updates to our snoozeland room that was done through crusade funds at the primary school in 2011. 
that room's coming up on eight, almost nine years old. Um, and like any piece of technology and any item routinely used by kids, there are parts that are either starting to break down or that are kind of losing interest and just not as functional as they used to be. So we're looking um, at replacing some padding in there as well as selecting some new items and opportunities that are more um, current, currently available with new off offerings for kids. And this, I want to give you just kind of an idea to, re to refresh your memory on what I'm talking about when I say snoozling room. These are, this is particularly what the latest room that the Crusade Fund in, which is at our middle school. This is shared between uh, middle school and ele elementary students. It's a larger room because it is shared between two locations and it's actually located right in the catwalk that connects um, those two buildings. But this is what I'm talking about when I say snoozling room. It stands for a Dutch word that essentially means too calm. Um, and the primary focus is to kind of put a child at ease, get them at rest, help them um, provide some sensory input that can be relaxing during a time of the day where they might need such an opportunity. So that's kind of what we've already got going on in our district schools. And what I do whenever we say, okay, we, we know we want this at the preschool, we know we need to do some updates to the primary school. I actually worked with Greg Spear, I'm sorry, um, Aaron Hunt at the high school, and he came over and did some drawings and was actually put, able to put some things together on CAD for me, which we were then able to um, transfer to the company, which is Flag House, who does these type of rooms. And they were able to give us a, a drawing of what the preschool room could look like. And what I have on here is just examples of different type of activities that would be in here, mirror ball, project, a, a, a aura projector, um, little peanut. I thought that was just a nickname for me at first, but apparently that's an actual seat <laughs> that, they, that they offer. Um, this is a bubble tubes and so forth. And I think you guys have this in your packet as well. And this is the primary school. We already have a great space at the primary that we've been using since 2011 for this. And we already have several great pieces that we're gonna be able to maintain. And those are outline, or, I'm sorry, those are in red parentheses. So anything that has a red parenthesis behind, or, yeah, behind it um, is items that we already own and we'll be able to keep. So you can see the, the primary room is getting several new updated, updated things. Some of the things we're going to have in both of these rooms that I thought would be neat to give you guys a little bit of a snapshot of are going to be shimmering light curtains that are these right here. These are fiber optic lights that students with autism and other developmental disabilities really enjoy. It really brings a, a calming sense to them. This fiber optic light spray would come off the floor or could come from a wall for, for students who are more uh, mobil mobility impaired. So they can actually drape that over them in a wheelchair or some other form of alternative seating. We're going to have waterless rainbow tubes in this one. One thing that was our OTs who maintain these rooms were very adamant about is if we get new bubble tubes at the preschool, which we don't have any, or if we needed to get new ones at the primary school, can we please do waterless? Because like a fish tank or anything else, you've got to change out the water um, regularly. So we're looking at some waterless tubes. We've got learning panels. These panels are going to line some of the walls, and they just kind of provide different sensory um, and motor input for kids. This is called a Multi-Finity Explorer panel, and this is, with each one of these buttons, a student can activate a new light and sound um, activity within this panel. There's also going to be, it's also going to be switch adapted for those students that can't get out of a wheelchair and get down to do it. We'll have something that we can actually set in their lap that they can manipulate and work through with. And this is a fiber optic sparkling tunnel. The one we hope to get is going to be a little bit larger than this. But a lot of our kids with autism really enjoy those tight and enclosed places where they feel like they can get um, a little bit of alone time, if you will, and a sense of calming. So we're going to have one of those, hopefully, in our primary room, should you guys approve our request to apply. Um, and the amount we're requesting from the Crusade totally is roughly $38,000. The snoozling room at the primary school would be around $20,000. The preschool would be around $14,000 an installation for both the preschool and the primary classroom would come around 32,000. Depending on the level of involvement of the electrical that we need, um, our own staff may be able to do some of this. And I've, I've talked to the director of, um, our, uh, Mr. Newton, director of maintenance, so for a little bit about it, and he's, he thinks there's some things they'd be able to handle, but just, I want to play it safe and go ahead and ask for that money from the crusade 
just to go ahead and have it accounted for because of the way it works. If you don't ask for it, they won't even consider you um, for it. So the overall amount requested is 38,000. Typically, we get around 30,000 every year. And what I will probably do, what I've done in the past is, based on the amount we get awarded, my staff and I will go through and kind of decide, okay, what are our priority items? And then kind of back it down from that. Um, there's a chance that we'll have other funds available, so maybe some IDEA, which are federal government preschool funds that we might be able to offset some mm -hmm. of the cost with, um, or funds um, through Medicaid reimbursement, that if there's items that we're just shy of being able to get that we think would really be beneficial to the rooms, we may still be able to, to, to do some of that. Um, so in closing, what we are essentially, or what you are essentially committing to as a Board of Education today is allowing us to approve the request of grant funds from the WHS Crusade for Children and agreeing that we will maintain items, just like I'm talking about changing water, providing updates, changing light bulbs, all these things that go along with owning any piece of um, technology. So that's what I'm asking for today is your all's approval to apply for the grant and hopefully making it happen. When do you hear back from that grant? Please? Good question, yeah. So typically around, it's been as early as May, but as late as uh, June. Okay. I love the May date because then, you know everybody's still here and I can kind of coordinate, mm -hmm. okay, can we get this done over the summer? So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for May, but they guarantee you by end of June. Okay. And what the way it'll work is from, I'll apply um, before mid-January. Actually, I'll probably work on it over Christmas break. And then in March, I usually get a letter that says, hey, we're interested in your grant you need to come and defend your grant to a, a panel similar to you guys and I will do a presentation and bring it, talk about the things we've done in the past. I always try to throw in some mama quotes and that sort of thing that they love to hear about, you know, why we need the money. But they've always been historically good, very good to us. But we do a lot for them too. We do a 5K every year. Mm -hmm. We do a coin war. We invite them out anytime we open a playground or a snoozling room or a room at the preschool. So they're, they love coming to Barstown. I'm actually emailing back and forth right now with Larry Ledford, who's their, one of their media liaison, and he's trying to get a calendar together, and I'm trying to line up some photo shoots with kids and parents for him over the, over the Christmas break. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, do I have a motion for approval of the 2019 uh, WHAS Crusade for Children grant applicant? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, any other further comments or discussion? All those in favor of the 2019 WHAS Crusade for Children grant application state aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Ms. Thank Reaper, you. Afterwards, I was having a page for you to sign up for Thank you. Great. Um, next item is our first review of the 2019, 2020, 2020 yeah. school calendar. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> kind of weird, isn't it? Oh, so, uh, first of all, uh, you know, there's, it, I just want to remind you of the change a couple of years ago in the committee that was, um, that was mandated to be put together uh, for, for every school district, uh, which we were already on board with that. The, um, we did add the uh, a board rep and uh, Mr. Roby has been doing that for the this year and last year. Um, so there is a committee. It's made up of principals, parents, teachers, uh, classified staff, and community members. Uh, there's about 11 of us total that that have come together. Um, I will say on on the calendar that uh, that you have in front of you, you have two options. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that we did work um, not just with our own people of getting these options together but with with the Nelson County School District I've been working pretty closely with uh, Jessica Sikulski she's the new DPP in uh, Nelson County so along with having some questions just about the job we've been able to uh, talk through what the calendar kind of would look like knowing that we want those calendars to match up as best they can for folks that have kiddos grand kiddos and in, in, in each district so uh, we work closely with them uh, with the uh, ATC in the area tech center you guys know how many kids now we're sending out there and how we need our schedules to be as close as possible to for us to be able to take advantage of that uh, tech center as much as possible as well um, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the days because you know that, that there are many days that are mandated by the state uh, that we have no control over. We just must follow the rules. Um, I do have two committee members, actually uh, Greta is on that committee and Mr. Roby is on the, the committee as well, so they'll be able to answer any questions. Uh, 
Uh, we have been to, met together uh, a couple of times um, where we sat down, kind of hashed everything out, uh, looked at a uh, basically uh, the two options that I told you about, and you have those uh, I think in front of you. But option A was was basically a starting point for us. That was kind of a mirror of the current calendar that we have right now, with not a lot of changes uh, to that. That had us at a uh, ending date uh, or a starting date of August the first and an ending date of June the 4th. Um, we presented this option. We let the, the option go back to all stakeholders. So if you were a teacher rep, you were supposed to get this to all teachers for them to see, get their feedback. Same thing for uh, best we could for parents and classified staff and things of that nature, uh, which we've been able to do that as well. Um, we did get a lot of feedback uh, after that and that is what led us to option B. So if you will pull the option B part up, you will see there were, there were some changes. The major, the major change was uh, for us to find four days, the, the June 1st through the 4th, we were able to uh, put into the calendar or take out of the calendar somewhere, uh, maybe a, a professional development day, a snow makeup day, uh, we were able to take those out and put us at, with an ending date of May the 29th. There are other factors that go into this. Um, uh, the testing window even comes into uh, part of play here because we test the last 14 days of our school district. The month of May has two days there that we're out. Uh, May the 19th is, a, is an election day and the 25th uh, being Memorial Day, so we have to take those days into account when we're backing up our calendar and looking at uh, when we're going to have the testing window. So many factors have gone into this. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, well, there's, I won't say thousands, there's been hundreds of emails back and forth between myself and some committee members. Um, can we do this? Why can't we do that? Again, a lot of those are mandated days uh, that are in the calendar. This is uh, part of the uh, new, um, uh, a new part was we would have a first reading. I used to bring you the calendar. We would show it. We would talk about it. We would approve it. Uh, we must have a first reading, which is what I'm doing today. Uh, and then it looks as though the feedback that I've received that most folks are looking at option B as the route that they, they want us to take right now. Um, that is not set in stone. I will be bringing that back to you uh, for final approval uh, in the January board meeting. Um, but I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have about the, the two uh, calendar options that you have in front of you or stakeholder questions, anything like that. No questions? Yes. The reason the 19th of May was X'd out, I'm sure y'all are aware of it, uh, because we have a, a voting precinct, two of, them, two of them in our school, and we can't, if, uh, we could have school in the other schools that don't have it, but we elected not just to let everybody out at one time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right. And the uh, uh, next item is the CMTA notice to proceed. So uh, you guys heard uh, the presentation during our special call meeting um, today. What this motion does is it just allows them to to get some um, verbal commitment from you. This is not a contractual uh, commitment at this point, just so that they can continue to, to do their work. Uh, if there were any chance of us getting any of these projects taken on in the summer, um, this was a necessary step. So this would just be giving them notice to proceed so they can continue with their work. Do I have a motion for approval for the notice to proceed? I'll make the motion. Second. Any further comments or discussion? All those in favor of approval of the CM CMTA notice to proceed say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried. Next item is the BG1 guaranteed energy savings contract. So uh, kind of the same, uh, some of the same things that have already been said for us to uh, even have a possibility or chance of doing some of this work uh, in the summer. Uh, it's necessary that we submit a BG-1. 
Um, that's uh, you're all <coughs> familiar with that to do uh, various projects. That um, that BG one is uh, includes all schools as a possibility. It, that that can be refined. It is not set in stone, but we need to have something in place if there is any chance that we're going to do any of this work this summer. So the narrative for the proposed project is not set in stone. That is correct. Okay. All right, do I have a motion for approval of the BG1 Guaranteed Energy Savings Contract? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Uh, any further comments or discussion? All right. All those in favor of approval of the BG1 Guaranteed Energy Savings Contract, state aye. Uh -huh. uh, all those opposed? Motion carried. Next item is the 2019 Board of Education Regular Board Regular Meeting Date Schedule. So uh, for as long as I know, uh, the board has met on the third Tuesday of every month at noon uh, here at Central Office as its uh, regular meeting location. So um, there was, I think, a memo that was provided for you that would lay out those various dates, how they fall on the third Tuesday, uh, assuming that you would want to continue the noon meeting here on the third Tuesday of each month. All right, do I have approval for the 2019 Board of Education regular meeting date schedule? So moved. All right, is there a second? Second. Any further comments or discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the 2019 Board of Education regular meeting date schedule, date, time, and location, state aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion mm -hmm. Next item is the travel authorization. So you would have in your board packet, I believe there's just one trip, and that's for the Barson High School Science Olympiad, uh, hoping to go to uh, Tennessee to Lincoln Memorial University uh, so that they can participate in this event. Uh, it is not an overnight trip. It's approximately, uh, the trip is for February the 2nd for 25 students uh, that would be taking a regular school bus. Okay, do I have a motion for approval of the travel authorization? So moved. Second? Second. Any further comments or discussion? All those in favor of the travel authorization state aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carried. My next item is the leave of absence request. So there's just one leave of absence request uh, that you should see is for an FMLA would be effective January the 2nd of 2019. Do I have a motion for approval of the leave of absence request? So moved. Is second. there a second? Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the leave of absence request state aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carried. Uh, personnel, retirement, resignation? Yeah, just to make you aware, we had uh, one retirement and two resignations. That information is in your board packet. Okay. And your site-based council minutes are in your packet also for your review. Do we have, do I have a motion for adjournment? Make a motion to adjourn. A second? Second. Okay. Uh, any further comments or discussion on that one? <laughs> All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carried. Meeting adjourned.